right, my friends, welcome back to the Weekend Interview Show. I'm Scott Horton. The website is weekendinterviewshow.com, and also you can find me on the blog and uh, sometimes an article here or there for antiwar.com. Uh, speaking of which, if you go to antiwar.com and click on the, the link More Viewpoints, you can find uh, my next guest's article from yesterday, The Myth of Zarqawi. Her name is Loretta Napoleoni. She's an Italian economist and reporter who's written about terrorism for Italy's financial papers for years. She's the author of Terror Incorporated, Tracing the Dollars Behind the Terror Networks, and her latest is called Insurgent Iraq, Al Zarqawi and the New Generation. Welcome back to the show, Loretta. Hello. Thank you very much for inviting me again. Oh, it's great to have you back on. Now, uh, I guess we need to start with the attacks that took place in Jordan um, on 11-9, uh, coincidentally. Uh, three hotels bombed in near simultaneous suicide bombings. Uh, do you agree with the uh, what seems to be the general conclusion that this attack was the work of uh, al-Musab al-Zarqawi? Yes, absolutely. It was. Uh, it's very much in line with his strategy. Um, he has been trying to attack uh, uh, Jordan for a long time. I mean, let's not forget that in early 1990s he was arrested uh, in Jordan for conspiracy um, to create uh, a cell, a jihadist cell, whose uh, final aim was to overthrow the Jordanian government. Right, and he's from there, and, and as you say in your book, uh, spent plenty of time in prison there and has been tortured there and has plenty of motivation. I, I believe I found in your book last night reference to an earlier plot by Zarqawi that actually included the Radisson Hotel in Amman, Jordan, right? Yes, that was the Millennium Plot. Um, it was uh, um, a series of attacks uh, which were going to take place uh, during the Millennium Celebration. Um, now, he actually, in the first trial um, that was you know, um, done in, in Jordan, the, the people who were part of the, the cell, which was planning this plot, which was foiled just a few months before by the Jordanian authority, his name was not mentioned among them. So later on, after 9-11, all of a sudden his name was inserted in the list of the participants, and then eventually um, the Jordanian authority uh, declared that he was... Uh, the, the ringleader, the man who had mastermind in their all attack. In reality, there is no one single proof, there is no evidence, real evidence, that he was even involved in the plot. Right, and in fact, that, that ties right in to the way, really, I guess, the, the title of your article for antiwar.com, The Myth of Zarqawi, uh, this idea of basically going and making Zarqawi the ringleader in a whole bunch of plots after the fact, going back to 1999 and 2000, because for some reason, I'm not exactly clear on why, uh, our government has decided here in the U.S. that they need a single boogeyman to be the leader of whatever it is that they're fighting. And since Osama bin Laden is stuck way far away in Pakistan, they basically just decided to create the, the Americans decided to create this myth about Zarqawi that uh, apparently he's grown into quite well. Yes, it's, uh, it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy what has happened. Now, let's remember that the reason why on um, February 5th, 2003, Colin Powell mentioned Al Zarqawi as the link between Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein was because the United States had failed to produce the proof that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. So without that, the only way to justify this war was to prove that uh, there was a link between international terrorism, in particular Al-Qaeda, and Saddam Hussein. And that link was Al-Zarqawi. Now, of course, now we know that it was not true. Now we know that all the evidence which was presented at the Security Council about Al-Zarqawi was completely fabricated. But at that time, the reaction of um, the world, including the Muslim world, was to believe what Colin Power had said to the Security Council. Right. Now, it wasn't completely fabricated, right? Because Zarqawi did have a base up in Kurdistan. It's just what was fabricated was that he was working for Saddam Hussein, right? 
Well, uh, no, actually, what he, he did have a base in Kurdistan, uh, absolutely. But what was fabricated was that he was part of Al Qaeda because he wasn't part of Al Qaeda, and that of course he, he had contact uh, with Saddam Hussein. So he actually was not the link between uh, um, these two because there was no link. Right, he wasn't even linked to either one. Exactly. Okay, well, I want to go ahead and add to this, and, and I'm sorry that I'm probably going to have trouble pronouncing the man's name, but for decades, I believe, at least 15 years or something, the uh, Pentagon reporter for NBC News is a guy named Jim Miklaszewski, or Sherwecki, yeah. Miklaszewski. Uh -huh. Anyway, on March 2nd, 2004, he reported for MSNBC that there were three different plans by the Department of Defense to go ahead and raid Kurdistan and uh, I believe it was near Kerma where Zarqawi had a couple of bases up there and the Department of Defense of the United States apparently three different times according to a man named Roger Cressy of uh, mm -hmm. the National Security Council cited in the MSNBC article they had three different opportunities to go and quote unquote take out Zarqawi before the invasion of Iraq and all three times the Republican politicians would not let them do so because they needed their Casa Spelli. They needed Zarqawi to be there so that they could say he was the link between Saddam and terrorism, as you say. If the DOD had been allowed before the war to go in and kill Zarqawi and his followers, then uh, that would have been one less excuse to invade the whole nation. Yes, that's interesting, actually. Um, I, I also think that... At that time, uh, before the war started, uh, Al Zarqawi was not uh, such a big leader. In fact, he was a very small leader of a small group of jihadis. Now, it was that group of jihadis that, uh, after the Battle of Tora Bora and the collapse of the Taliban regime, instead of going to Pakistan, where Al Qaeda leadership went, they actually crossed over to Iran, and then from there they went to Kurdistan. Um, so the Kurdish Secret Service knew that they were there, and it was the Kurdish Secret Service who alerted the American and presented Al Zarqawi as the link between Al Qaeda and um, um, Saddam Hussein. Um, so he wasn't uh, such a big leader. So I wonder if um, I mean I wonder even if they had gone in. Uh, in Kurdistan, if actually they would have achieved anything. I mean, you know, they would have, of course, uh, taken away the future myth, uh, but they would not have stopped the jihadist movement. Right. Uh, I know that this question sounds silly, but uh, I don't think I've ever found it uh, answered anywhere definitively. Is it true that Zarqawi has a wooden leg and that <laughs> Saddam Hussein had... Uh, Given, uh, had uh, taken care of him in the hospital and et cetera, et cetera. That was part of Powell's presentation too, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. Well, Zarqawi does not have a wooden leg. He was not wounded anywhere. Until he reached um, Iraq and the war started, he actually had never fought anywhere. We don't even know um, for sure if he was a Torah Bora. In fact, uh, although some of his um, former followers in uh, Afghanistan, when he ran uh, this small camp in Herat uh, at the border between um, Pakistan and Afghanistan, claim that he was a Torah Bora. I doubt it that he was a Torah Bora. Um, what, the story of the, le the wooden leg uh, it comes from a mistake. Now, his um, brother in law was a Mujahideen who he had met the first time he went to Afghanistan in 1989 and he had a wooden leg because he had been injured in battle and he had lost a leg. Oh, this was the guy who married Zarqawi's sister, right? Exactly. Right. So he, mm, he, uh, he befriended this Mujahideen and he used to visit him in, uh, in a hospital and at a certain point uh, he offered his sister in, ma in marriage to him. And now this is something that um, uh, the prophet and his followers used to do it was like a sign of friendship uh, of love uh, among you know warriors whereby they would offer sisters uh, in marriage to their companions uh, 
and the sister accepted the decision of the brother, so she traveled to Afghanistan. Now let's remember that at that time, we're talking about uh, the 89, 90, 91, it was very easy for people to, families of the Mujahideen to travel to Afghanistan. They actually got sponsorship also from various governments and the Arab Afghan Bureau. So she went there and she married him. And this is where the wooden leg story comes from. I see. Okay, now, I'm sorry to even divert us off onto that, that silly tangent, but uh, when you talk about um, Zarqawi not really being linked to al-Qaeda or to Saddam Hussein in the uh, time leading up to the invasion of Iraq, uh, mm -hmm. but you say that that was after he had actually had gone and fought in Afghanistan, maybe or maybe not at Tora Bora, but had been in Afghanistan with the Mujahideen there. So... Um, it, does that not contradict your statement that he was not really a member of Al-Qaeda at that point? Well, I mean, Al-Qaeda was just um, a small organization. In fact, Al-Qaeda was born as a sort of the ragged uh, vanguard of the Mujahideen, and so very few people were members of Al-Qaeda. I mean, not, not everybody that was in Afghanistan was a member of Al-Qaeda. Um, he had the opportunity to join Al Qaeda in 2000, but he refused it. Oh, ah, okay. Well, let's 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 leave off right there, so we can pick that up when we come back. Why he refused to join Al Qaeda in 2000? How was he left Afghanistan in 2001 or 2002 and still wasn't part of Al Qaeda? I'm talking with Loretta Napoleone. She's the author of the excellent book Insurgent Iraq: Al Zarqawi and the New Generation. My friends, welcome back to the Weekend Interview Show. I'm Scott Horton, and I'm talking with Loretta Napoleone. She's the author of the excellent new book, Insurgent Iraq, al Zarqawi and the New Generation. And you think I'm lying. I think it was excellent. I read the whole thing in one sitting last night. So yeah. that's proof that I really like it. I uh, also should Thank mention uh, she's got an article up at antiwar.com called The Myth of Zarqawi. That's a pretty tight little summation of the book, and I'd like to say that I hope you keep writing for antiwar.com. You definitely make a great contribution. Thank you. Hopefully yes, I would like to, yes. Oh, good, good. And I know that uh, that Eric and Matt and the rest of them uh, really enjoy your stuff, too. So, um, Thank you. Okay, now, oh, where we were... Uh, at the break there, was the question of exactly uh, Zarqawi's role uh, or relationship with al-Qaeda. He left after the, the American invasion of Afghanistan. As soon as we changed our focus to Iraq, uh, he basically left and went to Iraq as well. And at that point, he still was not officially a member of al-Qaeda. Is that right, Loretta? Yeah, yeah. Well, let me tell you first of all why he refused to join al-Qaeda. Mm, now, in uh, 2000, okay. we're talking about early 2000, uh, al Zarqawi ended up in Afghanistan. Um, the reason why he ended up there is because he uh, couldn't cross over from Pakistan uh, overland to go to Chechnya. He actually wanted to go to Chechnya and join Qatab, uh, who was fighting uh, the, the Russian at the time. He couldn't because he was arrested, his passport was taken, so the only option for him when he was released without a passport was either to go back to Jordan, which he didn't want to do, or to go to Afghanistan. So he gets to Afghanistan and he becomes a leader of a very small group of people, maybe 80 people, and they were primarily from Jordan, but also from Syria and Palestine. So the meeting with bin Laden was a meeting whereby al Zarqawi was trying to find funding in order to set up a small camp for his group. Um, so it's interesting this because bin Laden offered al Zarqawi to join Al-Qaeda and also he offered the members of his group to become part of Al-Qaeda. And al Zarqawi rejected because he could not accept Osama bin Laden's idea to fight America. al Zarqawi was very focused on Jordan, and this is why the attack a few days ago is very much in line with his policy. What he wanted to do was to find his way back to Jordan. So he wanted to become a jihadist to establish a certain credibility fighting in Chechnya and then go back to Jordan because his final aim is to overthrow 
the Jordanian government. So the split between he and bin Laden was really about the near enemy or the distant enemy. Bin Laden saying what we need to do is get everybody to come together to focus on fighting the Americans because they're the basis for all this. And Zarqawi instead wanted to focus on fighting the local puppets of the Americans instead. Exactly. Exactly. That was a big rift. And the reason why he wanted to go to Chechen is because before him, um, Katab, and this we're talking about the late 1990s when Katab, after 96, be- became the leader of the jihadists in Chechnya. Katab also had refused to embrace Osama bin Laden's strategy launched in 98 to concentrate their efforts against you know, the uh, foreign crusaders and Jews, i.e. the United States. So Katab, as al zarqawi wanted to be focused in the his own country. So he was looking at the near enemy, not at the faraway enemy. Okay, so now I believe it was, what, December 2004 that Osama finally said, okay, you're the leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq. Is that because Osama finally came around to Zarqawi's point of view? Well, at that point, Osama could not ignore al-Zarqawi any longer. See, it's, it's quite complex how things have evolved, and the way the things have evolved also shows how clever um, a tactician is al-Zarqawi. The al-Zarqawi enters the Iraqi insurgency in the summer 2003 because you know, he couldn't fight before. He could not face the American army. He enters after the insurgency started, uh, after the Shia insurgency has started. And from that moment onwards, he keeps the correspondence with bin Laden, seeking backing from bin Laden, because he's not a religious leader, he's a foreigner, so he could not rally the Sunni population around him. And in this conversation, he's presenting his strategy in Iraq, fight the Shia, and at the same time fight the coalition forces and the Americans. Fight the Shia in order to prevent the formation of a united front between the Shia and the Sunni, which would be naturally a secular front and a nationalistic front, and that will cut out the jihadists. Okay, now now let's hover on that point for a second there. Zarqawi wants to... um he does not want to join up with, say, Muqtada al-Sadr and fight as a common front against the occupation. He would no. rather fight against the Shia in yeah. order to prevent there being a secular and nationalist opposition to the American occupation. Yes, yes. And he was very clever in, uh, in this analysis because and, and clearly he must have somebody uh, with him ad- advising him, or somebody that knew the history of Iraq also, because you see, that United Front was what defeated the British in 1930s. At that time, the Shia and the Sunni did unite, and from that unity, what um, came out was a nationalistic front. Right, and in fact, we even saw for a time when America was attacking Fallujah, that um, up in Fallujah, they were celebrating Muqtada al-Sadr and some of the Shiites, and uh, I guess yes. Zarqawi went to move to put a stop to that as fast as he could. Exactly. All right, everybody. We're talking with Loretta Napoleone. She's the author of Insurgent Iraq. It's on your bookshelves now. Go get it. My friends, welcome back to the Weekend Interview Show. I'm Scott Horton. I'm talking with Loretta Napoleone. She's the author of Insurgent Iraq, Al-Zarqawi, and the New Generation, an excellent study of not just Zarqawi, but all the different factions in Iraq, the history of Al-Qaeda, how these different groups interact with each other. It's incredible stuff. The lady's been writing about terrorism for, uh, what, 20 years or something. She's interviewed uh, the Italian Red Brigades, uh, written about the IRA, uh, Definitely her expertise, and also I'll go ahead and recommend her other book, uh, which I interviewed her about last June, archive at weekendinterviewshow.com, called 
Uh, Terror Incorporated, Tracing the Dollars Behind the Terror Networks. Both of these books are absolutely incredible studies. And, in fact, um, I hate to divert too far off the point, but I kind of want to ask you just a little bit about how you wrote this book. Um, am, Am I to understand that you basically just traveled all around the world and, uh, you know, got a, a lot of these interviews yourself. I noticed, you know, information from uh, Zarqawi's classmates in school when he was a kid and, and people who were with him in Afghanistan. And it seems like you must have really trotted the whole globe writing this book. Am I right? Yes. Um, I actually worked uh, with um, a translator who is uh, from Spain, and he had uh, very um, good contact with um, a Syrian cell in Granada. Um, I mean, a group of jihadists, basically. They were not uh, active themselves, but they knew people. Uh, what we have done, we actually have not uh, mentioned any of the primary sources that we have interviewed. We use secondary sources to, to back what the primary sources have told us. And if you notice in the book, there, there are lots of um, references to documentaries that have been shown um, in the last year. In, um, in the Middle East. Um, so we used those sources because we, we really wanted to protect our original sources. And at the 11th hour, the translator decided that he did not want to be mentioned. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> this is a very difficult field, and sometimes you have to do that in order to carry on the research you're doing. Right. Well, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's called Insurgent Iraq, Al Zarqawi and the New Generation, and uh, it's on your bookstore shelves right now. And and the subject basically is, is that uh, more than anything else, Al Zarqawi himself, um, as I like to call him, America's self-fulfilling prophecy. And um, you know, when you talk about the myth that was built up around Zarqawi, uh, originally to ch- sort of try to conflate him with Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein as an excuse for war, but then also uh, he ends up taking the credit or receiving the blame, uh, however you prefer to look at it, for pretty much every suicide bombing and terrorist attack that takes place in Iraq. And basically American propaganda has turned this guy from uh, ex-rapist, uh, convict to, uh, you know, uh, Lex Luthor, the criminal mastermind, in charge of uh, terrorist attacks from from London to uh, probably Indonesia and and Casablanca and everywhere in between, too. Yeah, uh, I think, I think uh, the, the most interesting side of this story is actually the fact that uh, the United States, together, of course, with Jordanian authorities and the Kurdish Secret Service, created this guy out of nothing. I mean, he was a complete nobody the day in which the Americans enter Iraq. He was. Um, and today he is what we were told he was um, in uh, 2003. And this is because we have constructed around him sufficient legends that people have believed. So money has started going in this direction. People have joined this group, and then for what concern outside Iraq, which is also another aspect that we've got to take into consideration, he has inspired this new generation of jihadists. Right, and we... Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was saying, yes, people like, you know, the, the, the the July 7 suicide bombers, yes. Right, well, and we also see there was the rocket attack in August on an American ship at port, and now we see the suicide bombings in Jordan. So uh, not only have we created terrorism in Iraq, that did not a country that did not have a terrorism problem before we invaded, but now the uh, the terrorist uh, training camp basically that we've created out of Iraq is already spreading jihadists to neighboring states. Yes, yes, that's 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 uh, the, the the real consequences of what we have done is that uh, it's not only Iraq, which is already. Uh, which is already absolutely terrible, but also what is happening outside. You know, I've, I've been on, on many uh, on television and radio shows recently, and everybody asking, you know, do you think there's going to be another attack? And even tonight, you know, with the BBC, and they're asking such the same question. And unfortunately, I have to say yes, 
course there is going to be another attack. I mean, I don't know where it's going to be. I mean, it can be in London or it, it can be in, in Amman or it can be in, uh, in Cairo. But there will be another attack because, you know, these guys now are part of an anti-imperialist ideology. They are part of al-Qaeda. And the men who helped the transition of al-Qaeda from a small armed organization, Ali Integrated, very similar to the Red Brigades uh, of you know, the 1970s, and to an anti-imperialist movement, is actually al Qaeda and it makes the legends which we have created. So we we sort of uh, with our policy we've turned Al Qaeda, which is a small group of individuals, into Al Qaedaism, which is just sort of a, a belief system. Yes, absolutely. Y- you know, after the Battle of Tora Bora, um, Al Qaeda was completely destroyed. I mean, the majority of the member of uh, Al Qaeda had been either arrested or you know they were dead. The one that survived escaped. And they went to to Pakistan. Um, there was a moment from you know, the end of the Taliban regime until the beginning of the Iraq War, in which the jihadist movement was lost. I mean, they really did not have a, a focal point. They did not have an icon anymore because Osama bin Laden was in hiding. And you know, we, we've seen the attack in Istanbul, for example, and the attack in Indonesia. Those were attacks conducted by local groups. The attack in Indonesia actually was um, in the pipeline already before 9-11. So it was not really uh, part of Al-Qaeda. I mean, Al-Qaeda's last attack was 9-11. They haven't done anything after that. But thanks to al-Zarqawi and to the war in Iraq today, the message of Bin Laden, which is, you know, America and the West in particular, are, you know, the hegemonic power, which is oppressing our people. Therefore, you know, we have to destroy them, has become an ideology. And as you say, it really is based on that, that very first premise that it's a defensive jihad being fought against foreigners on their land. And yeah. I, I can't help but escape notice that they're right. It's not like any Arab countries are occupying North America or Western Europe, is it? Yeah, I mean, it is a defensive jihad because, of course, now we we invaded Iraq. So the the troops are present there. Um, You you cannot call it anywhere else. I mean, I I know that uh, for Ransfield, this is the liberation, but the reality is from people who are there in Iraq, uh, this is an occupation. So... Basically, the war in Iraq has proven to the Muslim world, especially to the extremists, to the to people that are already thinking of joining the, the jihadist movement, uh, has proven that what Osama bin Laden has been saying since the beginning of the 90s, since you know, the, the, the Gulf War, basically, is true. Yeah, well, that's a pretty good anti-terrorism strategy, I guess. Uh, it seems like maybe our leaders still believe that they hate us for our freedom, so they've decided instead to just go ahead and get rid of all our freedom. And The Senate, oh, yeah. of course, just, just passed a bill to go ahead and repeal habeas corpus for anybody that the Supreme Court said won it in their last court case. Absolutely. So, now, there's Absolutely. a way to fight terrorism. If they really do hate us for our freedom, just take all our freedom away, and then we should be fine, right? Well, that's the, exactly what, unfortunately, Tony Blair is trying to do. But uh, if, if you have seen what happened um, two days ago here in London, the, um, actually his own people, his own member of the Labour Party had voted against uh, the, this anti-terrorist legislation where people can be uh, kept um, in police custody for 90 days, 90 days without being charged. Um, so I think, you know, in the United Kingdom, things are beginning to change because um, the British do not want a, sta- a police state. And in reality, what he is provoking, it is the beginning of a police state. And this is something that I don't think he's going to get away with it. Well, this is something that Americans need to consider very carefully, that in Britain, where they don't have a Bill of Rights or a Constitution, just a yes. parliamentary system, that yes. they have stood up to Tony Blair and said, no, you may not hold people for 90 days. Yes. And then the next day in the U.S. Senate, they said, you can hold them forever, yes. and we don't care at all. And yes. that's in the land of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. I think that's important for us to keep in mind that, 
you know, uh, in Britain, the public opinion is enough to stop it. Here, we supposedly have a constitution that would stop something like this from happening, and it doesn't. And the but public think, opinion sure doesn't either. But I, I think it's because people are scared. People don't know. I mean, look, one news that I thought you should have really hit the front page of the newspaper was the story two weeks ago of the secret prison run by the CIA. I mean, that news was not really big news. Not here, not, not, not I was in the States, actually. Not, not in the States. I mean, I think that really should shock Americans. How is it possible that... You know, the, 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 the strongest democracy in the world is actually keeping people you know, outside the country in order to be able to avoid the, what is you know, the legislation of the country. I mean, yeah. We don't know where it's Bin Labish and Sheikh Mohammed, the two people that mastermind in 9-11. We don't know where it's Abu Zayeda, who is you know, another, who is one of the key accus, uh, one of the key people. They actually admitted that Al Zarqawi was the link between Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein. I mean, we don't know what these people are. Nobody can, can even talk to them and find out exactly what they actually are saying. Right, they're being held completely outside the rule of law. And as that news story that came out in the Washington Post last week uh, yeah. now informs us, literally at former Soviet gulags. Exactly. Under exactly. new management, the USSA. And it no, makes me is, proud to be an American. No, this is going to be discussed, by the way, by the Supreme Court. It's in the list uh, of the items that will be discussed in the next month by the Supreme Court. So we'll see what, what's going to happen because you know, this is clearly something that um, the America um, should not do. And whoever has given the order and the permission, including, for example, you know, giving permission to certain types of tortures, the idol tortures was condemned by the Declaration of uh, Human Rights, uh, which was, you know, subscribed by the United States. So how is it possible that we are allowing certain kind of torture? Absolutely, and torture is outright banned in the Constitution of the United States in the Eighth Amendment and the Fifth Amendment. The Eighth Amendment says that they cannot use any cruel or unusual punishment, and the Fifth says that you cannot be made to incriminate yourself. And both of those things were to protect people from ever being tortured. But I guess that's all out the window now. Exactly. exactly. Okay, now, now let me ask you, getting back to the attacks in Jordan that happened a few days ago, why exactly this tactic? What does uh, al-Musab al-Zarqawi have to gain from blowing up hotels in Amman? Well, I mean, he wants to destabilize the... Um, the Jordanian government, uh, and what best way to do that by starting a terrorist activity inside the country. Um, now, clearly there is, a, there is a symbolic message also in this attack. I mean, it's attacking hotels, which are very popular among Americans, Israelis, but also, also rich Iraqis, um, uh, the, this new elite of Iraqis, predominantly Shia, who um, has been created since um, the end of the Saddam regime. And these people, actually, many of them, have taken residence uh, in um, Jordan to protect themselves. And um, they uh, they frequent these hotels. Um, so there is a clear message saying you know, uh, to King Abdullah, I mean, you cannot continue to be the ally of the West because if you do that, you know, we'll punish you. Um, at the same time, I think uh, that he also wants to reiterate his statement that Jordan is still his final objective, that he has not forgotten his own country, that he has not forgotten his fight, uh, the one you know, that he started in the 1990s. It's interesting because, you know, so many people in Jordan, I mean, they just came right, on, right out in the street denouncing Zarqawi and, and turning against him, but... If I understand the, the tactics of terrorism correctly, basically what he's shooting for here is to force the Jordanian government to clamp down ever harder so as to turn the people of Jordan against their own state. I think what's going to happen is that, <coughs> that the, the people who have demonstrated <coughs> sorry, in the streets uh, are the people that they were never um, supporters of al Zarqawi or, you know, of his tactics. So those people were never people that you would ever be able to recruit. 
But the people that are now being put in jail, um, and we're talking about hundreds of people, those people had a chance in his plan to become part of his insurgency. And now that they are in jail, and we know how Arab jails are run, they're probably tortured, some of them, some of them, because of this experience, will become more radicalized, and then they will join this insurgency. So in the long run, this attack, I think, is not going to be negative for him. As many media are saying today, many media are saying, oh, you know, Jordan is turning against al-Zarqawi. But you know, the Jordanian uh, uh, um, establishment uh, was never in favor of al-Zarqawi. Right. Is the fringes, see, is the fringes, is the poor, is the people in Zarqa, is the Palestinian um, second, third generation in um, the refugee camps, is the unemployed youth, those are the guys that were sympathetic to him. And if you put them in jail and torture them, then he has a good chance to recruit them next. Right, and you know, isn't that the story we see over and over again with Zarqawi and Zawahiri and quite a few other of these guys? They were already kind of angry uh, religious radicals, but then they went to jail and got tortured. And when they came out of uh, torture academy, they decided that they were going to be torturers themselves. Exactly, exactly. That's what's happened. The radicalization of this individual is always linked to traumatic experiences. Arab jails are the best recruiting uh, ground for this individual. And this is what we have to understand. Repression and war are not going to bring us a better world. All right, everybody, I'm talking with Loretta Napoleone. She's the author of Insurgent Iraq, Al-Zarqawi, and the New Generation. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Weekend Interview Show. We're wrapping up with Loretta Napoleone. She's the author of Terror Incorporated, Tracing the Dollars Behind the Terror Networks, and her new book, Insurgent Iraq, Al-Zarqawi and the New Generation. You can find a great article that she wrote uh, that was up yesterday at antiwar.com. If you just go to antiwar and page down to the More Viewpoints link and click on that, uh, you can find her article, The Myth of Zarqawi. And basically what we're talking about here today is how the myth of Zarqawi has come true. The propaganda was so thick there for a while, many people were doubting whether this guy even existed at all. And uh, apparently what Loretta Napoleoni has found is that this terrorist has very much grown into the role that the United States has created for him. Isn't that right, Loretta? Yes, yes, exactly. I mean, it does exist, uh, unfortunately. And he has become what we basically wanted him to be um, in uh, February 2003. Now, of course, uh, um, it's, it's not a link with anybody. It's very much his own man, uh, but he is um, a very strong uh, force today in the insurgency in Iraq. He's not in control of the insurgency, not at all, but he is a strong force. I wonder sometimes whether he does more harm than good for the Sunni insurgents. Uh, some of the more drastic suicide attacks against Shiite mosques and that kind of thing. Uh, do they, do the Sunni imams not uh, disapprove of the way Zarqawi does his own freelance terrorism? Absolutely, absolutely. The religious authorities, the Sunni religious authorities, are very much against him. In fact. Um, they even tried to kidnap him at a certain stage last year in order to neutralize him. Of course, you know, it's very difficult to do that uh, because, you know, the guy is a bit of um, the Arab Zorro. You know, the jihad is Zorro. He's everywhere, but, you know, nobody ever managed, you know, to catch him. Um, but, yes, for sure, this sectarian war, which he started, 
is um, it's very negative for this an insurgency because it's giving this an insurgency a certain kind of connotation. Now, having said that, uh, what we have to bear in mind is that the Shia are not much better than the Sunni because the Shia have these terror gangs. Um, the Bada brigades. Exactly. Yeah, death squads. The death squads who actually do this uh, kind of targeted killing uh, and you know, the killing of the two lawyers of Saddam Hussein, for example. Sure. Well, the they just found 27 bodies, uh, all of them handcuffed and shot in the back of the head just two days ago. Exactly. It happens all the time. Yeah, it happens all the time. And that technique, uh, it's uh, a technique that comes uh, from uh, the Iranian death squads, which were very active in the 90s uh, and, and late uh, 80s. Now, um, the people who are now leading the terror squads are people who have spent um, many years in exile in Iran uh, during the Saddam regime, and some of them were running prisoner camps for Iraqis during the um, Iran-Iraq war. Right, so no wonder, I guess, that all the American politicians now are uh, inviting Chalabi back into the fold because they're trying to split the difference between Zarqawi and the Supreme Council for Islamic Revolution is backed by Iran. What a mess. Who, flip a coin. It's a real mess, and it's going to get even more messy uh, as we get closer to the 15th of December when, you know, the new parliament is meant to take place. Right. All right, everybody. You want to understand what's going on in, going on in Iraq. Read Insurgent Iraq, al Zarqawi and the New Generation by Loretta Napoleone. Thanks again, Loretta. Thank you. It was a pleasure.